This video is brought to you by Brilliant. In only a few weeks' time, the UK goes to the polls. No, it's not a general election. We'd have released a lot more videos if it was. Instead, it's the local elections. Although the news will usually report on the local elections, they're not exactly the biggest event in politics. This election, though, it's a bit different. This is because it's the first time that the new voter ID rules will be used in an election. Proponents claim that they're necessary to prevent electoral fraud and to bring the UK in line with other similar Western nations. Opponents claim that these new voter ID rules will reduce turnout of younger people, who are usually more left-wing, as they are less likely to have relevant ID. So let's have a look into this issue and see whether the recent voter ID changes are necessary and how they'll impact the local elections. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. We're going to split this video into three main sections. In the first, we're going to explain what the new voter ID rules are and what they've changed, providing the arguments for. In the second, we're going to have a look at the arguments against. And in the final section, we're going to have a look at the likely impact this will have in this year's local elections. In previous elections, voter ID simply wasn't necessary in order to cast a ballot. Voters could walk into a polling station, give their name and address, and be given a slip of paper on which they can cast their ballot. This all changed last year with the passing of the Election Act of 2022, albeit after a bit of a scrap with the House of Lords on which IDs are and aren't acceptable. We'll get on to this a bit more later. The changes effectively mean that voters will need to show one of 22 valid forms of photo ID in order to be able to cast a ballot. This includes Oyster 60 plus cards and Freedom Passes, but does not include 18 plus Oyster cards, National Rail cards, or student ID cards, leading some to claim that the new changes are unfair to the younger generation, as their equivalent ID are not valid. It's also important to note that if people don't have an in-date valid photo ID, they can use an expired valid ID, provided that the image on it is still clearly theirs. This was introduced as the government noticed that a huge number of people in the UK do not have a valid photo ID, and by introducing this, it would allow a huge number more people to also be allowed to vote. Furthermore, people are also allowed to register for a voter authority certificate from their local authority. This is a free form of ID that will allow people to vote. However, only a tiny fraction of those who could apply for the new free voter ID have done so. So that's how the new system works, but why was it introduced in the first place? In their explanatory notes on the bill, the government refers to the Pickles Report, a report on electoral fraud produced by Conservative peer Lord Pickles in 2016. He argues that people could be coached to commit impersonation and could overcome the only current check at the ballot box, in which voters are simply asked to confirm their name and address. The report ends by recommending that the government consider ways to stop this from being possible. The government argues that this view was backed up by the Electoral Commission in 2014, which also concluded that the government should introduce some form of voter identification. Now, a natural question to ask here is how much of a problem has electoral fraud been in the UK? And, well, there isn't really, but we'll get onto that in a bit more detail in a second. What's interesting, though, is that when Tory ministers are presented with this information, they respond by claiming the true scale is hard to be certain of. Well, of course, one of the issues with voter impersonation is you don't, by definition, you don't know when it's happening. And when you can turn up to a polling station, as you currently can, mm -hmm. and just say, my name is John Smith um, and I live at number 10 Acacia Avenue, um, that's it. You just get given the polling card. So presumably you've and, got and lots you, of evidence. And, and, you, and you vote. Well, as I, as I just said, it's the kind of, a kind of thing where, by definition, it doesn't get detected. Some might argue that legislating against crimes we don't actually know are happening may sound a little silly. So much for recorded crimes but crimes we know nothing about are going up as well. Regardless, these arguments have been echoed in Parliament too, with the Conservatives arguing that it's not about statistics, it's about the principle. So, with this in mind, let's move on and have a look specifically at the arguments against. Let's start by digging down a bit further into the argument that there's no history of electoral fraud in the UK. 
The Electoral Commission, which is completely independent from government, claimed simply that there is no evidence of large-scale electoral fraud in the past five years. Between 2018 and 2022, there have been 1,386 cases of alleged electoral fraud to the police. Of these, there were only nine convictions and six cautions. Ultimately, considering that tens of millions of ballots were cast between these years, it's understandable why the Electoral Commission came to this conclusion. Additionally, while the government has allowed a wide range of ID, it's telling that student cards and 18 plus Oyster cards aren't accepted. Younger people tend to be more left-wing, and many have argued that it's simply a crude attempt by the government at voter repression. The only reason the government even needed to list a range of cards is because the UK doesn't have government ID. The new Labour government tried to introduce this, but it was ultimately scrapped in 2011. Having a universally government-issued card eliminates the argument of which forms of ID are or aren't valid, and assuming that this was either free or low cost, it would also eliminate any arguments of fairness. It could be argued that it was irresponsible of the government to introduce these new voter ID rules without introducing these universal identity cards. This debate over what kinds of ID are and aren't valid caused the main opposition parties to write a joint letter to the government explaining that they think the changes are a blatant attempt by the Conservatives to rig the results of future elections by preventing people from voting, especially those unlikely to vote Conservative. So let's move on to the last part of this video and have a look at how this could affect the local elections. The main way that this could affect local elections is in affecting turnout. Turnout for these kind of elections are already pretty poor. In the last set of locals taking place in May last year, turnout was 33.6%, which, considering that general elections tend to garner turnout in the mid-60% range, is pretty abysmal. And the thing is, even Conservatives appear to accept that these new voter ID changes will result in a worse turnout. Former Tory Cabinet Minister David Davis has claimed that this policy risks having a more deleterious effect on voting than the issue the new law is attempting to solve. Ultimately, we'll only know how deleterious the effect is after this year's local elections. These are all clearly huge decisions, but one much smaller, easier decision you can make is improving your skills and career prospects with Brilliant.org. That's because, while we all know that the promise of AI is that it'll make our lives easier, it's very possible it'll make our work lives more difficult, replacing some people and requiring different skills of others. Brilliant, however, is the best way of improving your STEM skills quickly and in a fun way, investing in your own human intelligence. That's because Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, decision making and more, with new lessons added monthly. And by the way, these lessons are interactive and engaging, designed around principles of active learning, so there's no boring lectures here. That means that by investing a few minutes every day in lifelong learning, you can improve your skills and feel a real sense of accomplishment. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days by clicking on the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support and for watching TLDR.